Kyle Bishop's The Sub Subaltern Monster, Imperialist, Hegemony, and the Cinematic Voodoo Zombie is a really great article and it makes a number of fascinating points that relate to a bunch of topics we've been thinking about in this class. It also helps clarify some ideas, I think, in ways that will be very useful to us as we move forward in this course. Um, I've had a chance actually to meet uh, Dr. Bishop at several conferences over the past uh, couple of years uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, where I head down once a year for the Southwest Popular Culture Association. And it's always really fun to hear him speak uh, and to hear his students speak on zombies as well. And this article is great, particularly the first half of it, which is what we'll be considering um, in this uh, video today. Well, the whole thing is, is good, but the first half is, is important for today just because it, it covers a lot of ground that we've already covered, okay? And I like it because you get to hear somebody else say some of the basic things um, in a very clear way that I've been gesturing towards for the past couple of weeks. So when we look at what Bishop's saying, one of the things that you'll see that he does really well um, is he lays out basically the, the context for um, the, the Magic Island. Okay, so what are some of the major investigations of Haiti that appeared in print prior to the Magic Island? In this course, we've been talking about the Magic Island as kind of the first initial major kind of you know, travelogue point of contact for uh, Americans as it relates to Haiti. And we've talked a little bit about the kind of soft invasion of Haiti in the, in the, in the 19 teens and 1920s and how that led up to the production of the Magic Island. What Bishop does is he goes far deeper than that and he points towards a number of texts from the 19th century that deal with Haiti, okay? And essentially they deal with Haiti in a number of incredibly uh, negative ways in the sense that they set up the island to be this very savage place of, uh, you know, uh, uh, cannibalism, voodoo priests, dark magic, and all of this kind of stuff. So there's a bunch of texts that are mentioned there. And one of the reasons that that's important is because that sets up um, um, a, a general understanding of the ignorance that North Americans may have had or Americans may have had for the people of Haiti. There hadn't been a lot of um, accurate, precise, uh, ethnically sensitive material that had necessarily been produced. It wasn't that it was all dark and mysterious, it was just simply that there was this history of a lot of cultural confusion about the people of Haiti and what was going on on the island. So Bishop does a really good job of lining that up and he shows you all of the titles that provide some context for that. He also does a really good job showing you the term zombie and how the word zombie changes. Here, earlier in this course, we've thought about the word gothic and how the word gothic changes over time, right? But if you look on 143 in Bishop's article, um, uh, we get this great description here starting in that first uh, paragraph on the right-hand column. Uh, the first recorded use of the word in print appeared as early as 1792 in a text by Frenchman Moreau de saint Mary. I'm assuming that I'm pronouncing that right, where he defines it as a Creole word that means spirit, revenant. However, the term was more often used in the 1800s to describe the voodoo snake god or to refer to Haitian revolutionary Jean Zombie. Okay, so there's a lot more there, but we do get a few lines down. It was not until 1912 that the word zombie became associated with the living dead. And he goes on to describe how he knows that and where that information comes from. So what you can see is that in about a period of 120 or so years, roughly speaking, the word makes some rather uh, dramatic uh, changes from being something that's used to address the spirit world to being used to address uh, an individual, uh, the living dead, somebody presumably without a soul. And how does that come about? Well, for the purposes of this lecture, that's not necessarily so important, as is the basic idea that what the zombie was addressed as has changed over time, okay? And that's fundamental to a viewing of, let's say, white zombie, and then to a viewing of, say, uh, king of the zombies, which we've just kind of completed. As we go forward in this course, not immediately, but in the next half dozen or so films that we watch, we're going to see this, this conception of the zombie change rather dramatically from this mindless servant uh, that simply moves under the command of a zombie master to being something quite different. When we get to Night of the Living Dead, we'll of course see the zombie without any kind of 
uh, controlling force uh, behind it, other than the forces of nature that kind of compel it to exist. But that's a that's a topic for another day. So Bishop early on in this in this article does a really good job of laying out kind of the 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 history of the zombie in writing and the history of Haiti in writing, and he shows how and where these two things intersect. So there's a lot of good opportunity here for um, future or further reading. Now what Bishop does that's also very useful is that he is going to provide you with a different um, way of thinking about the zombie than the way I have presented in this class. So if you go back to our very first lecture together, I said that you know there were a number of ways to approach the zombie and I gave you the metaphor of a house and there are many ways into the house and that we were going to take the the entrance way uh, of literature, okay? Use literature and the study of literature as a way to approach the zombie, think about the zombie, and talk about the zombie. And how we've been doing that for the past week or so in this course is we've been looking at it through the lens of the Gothic and the Gothic literary tradition, which is far broader than the zombie itself, but which provides, I would argue, an excellent context for the zombie, and in particular our study of zombies in various films and television shows uh, this term. I won't rehash all of that. You're all a little kind of a little bit more uh, expert in the concept of the gothic, to, gothic today than you maybe were at the beginning of the course, but what I want to point out is that Bishop takes another but really fascinating approach to the zombie, and what Bishop's going to do is he's going to bring in these really interesting philosophers and theorists like Hegel and Spivak, and he's going to introduce some brand new concepts that we can use to think about zombies and what they are and what they represent. Now he's talking in particular, as he's very straightforward about it in the title, the cinematic voodoo zombie, okay? Um, and that's useful to us because the terms he's going to give us or the, the, the concepts he's going to give us allow us to kind of go back and think about the zombies that we have encountered and to you know wonder about whether or not his points are useful for describing what we're seeing in films like, you know, uh, White Zombie, Sex Maniac, uh, Revolt of the Zombies, and now King of the Zombies. So one of the first things he does is he links him with this idea um, of the master-slave dialectic, okay, which comes to us from Hegel. It's a very complicated, very broad idea that ex ex it exceeds what uh, Bishop is presenting in this article, but the essential point, and it's a great point, is that he looks at people who have, who have theorized the relationship between kind of masters and slaves, okay? And one of the kind of famous things that Hegel says and that Bishop distills in this article is that the relationship between a master and a slave is one of, uh, of recognition. Uh, one must always recognize the other, and they're kind of caught up in that mutual recognition. The master has to recognize the slaves as slaves, and the slaves have to recognize the master as the master. And in that way, they become kind of mutually dependent. And it, like, oh, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to mirror murder's gesture there, but uh, what I was trying to suggest is that that, that there, that's a lot less creepy. Um, um, when the master and the slave recognize each other, uh, that is the foundation of their essential relationship, and we can begin to pick it apart against those terms. If we think about that concept, and we apply it to things like White Zombie, we apply it to things like Sex Maniac, we apply it to things like uh, Revolt of the Zombies and King of the Zombies, we might start to ask, you know, what is the nature of that relationship? What is the nature of the recognition between the master and the slave and their dependence upon each other? Well, it seems to be dramatized, um, at least in terms of white zombie and revolt of the zombies and king of the zombies, in the sense that the, the relationship is one of a fundamental power dynamic that is something to be resisted on the part of the zombies. So, so what does that mean? Well, when I watch White Zombie, how does it conclude? It concludes essentially with the man who's being transformed into the zombie, Beaumont, reacting very violently to his awareness that he's turning into a zombie and he, in fact, murders murder uh, as a result. If we think about revolt of the zombies, what do we get? As soon as the slave, as soon as the zombie spell is broken, 
what do these zombies do? They seek out and destroy their master. When we think about um, King of the Zombies, what happens once the spell is compromised? What do the zombies do? They seek out and destroy their master. So Hegel's theory is useful in that it allows us to kind of understand this concept of recognition and how the zombie master has to control the, the terms and the consequences of recognition. By, what, by that I mean the zombie master works a spell or some other uh, in some other way has somehow deluded the zombies or prevented the zombies from responding to the fact that they are zombies because once they seem to become aware that they are zombies their their initial drive is to murder the person who has turned them into slaves okay so it's not a sustainable system um it, it's not the case that the zombies are going to police themselves it's a situation in which the zombie master has to be kind of continually exerting his force or her force, although we haven't seen any women as zombie masters yet in the course, over the slaves for the system to be maintained. So it's one in which the slaves are certainly at the uh, uh, under the control of the master, but the master is also himself under the control of the slaves, because if he allows the spell to be broken, he will die. He will be destroyed by them. So Hegel's kind of dialectic about the master-slave relationship, it's usually applied to actual people in the world, but here we have Bishop in a really interesting way applying it to this fantasy creature situation, these creatures from folklore, and it kind of invites them into a broader conversation about slavery and its implications for people. Now, I think that's particularly important if you look at a film like um, King of the Zombies, because the King of the Zombie film tries to seems to want to have it both ways because of its representations of race and ethnicity. Okay, Jeff and Samantha are clearly servants of uh, Doctor Sangra, and uh, well, and uh, and uh, well, Samantha is Jeff is obviously uh, the valet for uh, Bill. Um, um, uh, Bill Summers, uh, but Jeff does not seem to at all mind his position, right? He's presented as this very happy, affable, self-deprecating, um, content, uh, essentially servant, which is, you know, probably too polite a word for it. And we have the sense that, you know, um, he would never want to harm Bill, right? So they seem to be perfectly happy with each other in this weird um, you know, uh, racially divided relationship. And when we think about, you know, Samantha and her reference and her relationship with Dr. Sangra, she doesn't seem to be at all displeased about her role as a servant, even in these very horrifying conditions for her, for her master. She seems to be quite content. That plays into, and one of the things Hegel lets us understand, but this plays into this very long, sad, kind of tragic history, this, this preconception, uh, particularly by white uh, individuals in the United States, that people who are in servants' roles are somehow happy to be in those roles, or that people from certain ethnic classes kind of desire to be in certain servant roles, which is a gross, you know, racist view of people and assuming all kinds of negative things about them based on their their racial background and we see it dramatized in this film so one of the reasons a film like you know king of the zombies is maybe so unnerving is because the the attitude of the zombies towards the zombie master that is the desire to murder him once they are free from their spell doesn't seem to be something that applies also to the film's kind of real life servants and real life slaves we would assume that they too would have some kind of animosity some kind of disregard some kind of displeasure for the situation that they're in if you know they have to continually be self-deprecating with regards to their their master character they have to continually be uh, supportive and you know deferential to that individual uh, for no apparent reason other than there seems to be this ethnic distinction between the people involved and that's a really un unsettling aspect of the film right um, why aren't the human beings as upset by their essential slavery as the zombies um, why, why, is it, why is it only the dead who would uh, rise up and fight back if they, once they recognize that they're slaves? So when we look at something like the King of the Zombies, um, that might give us another way to think about what's going on in the film, 
Or maybe what's not going on in the film, and what's not going on in the film is we're not getting a really interesting commentary on uh, the implications of uh, kind of ethnically divided servant classes or racially divided servant classes. And it seems to overlook the fundamental issue, as Hegel makes us aware, of the master-slave dialectic, which is essentially that one party is always looking at the other party and judging the other party, uh, and that that has to be maintained. So it's not going to be the case that you're going to have slaves who are just simply like, you know, just content uh, to be slaves. They're always, they're always aware of the domination that is over them, man probably working against and to resist that domination. So it's really great that Bishop brings that concept into his discussion of the zombies. He also does this really interesting thing uh, with Spivak, who gives us the, co the concept of the subaltern. Okay, so individuals um, in society, as you see on 146, uh, who were essentially at the very lowest level of human society, who are dominated by a bunch of different kinds of classes and organizations and people in society and who are essentially um, you know divorced from the concept of being able to speak back to those in power or to speak back to those who are holding them in some kind of slavery some kind of bondage it's a fairly famous concept and if you're interested in it um, Bishop does a really good job of summarizing it here and one of the things that he says is that the zombie essentially constitutes a new class in society it's not simply that they're dominated in the way that the subaltern are dominated but they're also dominated to a further extent by their simple inability to communicate with each other to organize which is something that Spivak subaltern women can do they can at least talk to each other they just can't talk up the chain in society um, and that's fascinating for a couple of reasons. One is that we have to remember that for the people in Haiti that are being addressed in Seabrook's book, the zombies aren't fantasy. The zombies are a, a class of people in society. Now, that doesn't mean the dead came back to life. Okay, sorry, I don't mean to, to, to ruin your day by, by destroying that fantasy. But the zombie is a class in society that Seabrook is looking at. It's a kind of individual in a certain kind of social situation who lacks the ability to act beyond the way in which he or she is directed. So when Bishop starts talking about the sub-subaltern, right, um, we might wonder about whether or not there are any human groups who could be associated with this new category. So it's not just that they're dominated and can't talk up the chain, it's that they're dominated and they can't even talk to each other anymore. They can't even organize anymore. Uh, it's the ultimate lowest possible rung you could you could have in society. Complete alienation from every other group that's that's pushing you down. Uh, maybe that's one of the fundamental fears the zombie story is speaking to. So he does a really good job with that, and he sets all of that up as context for White Zombie, the film, which he then goes on to discuss and talk about in great detail. And we'll focus a lot more about that and think about that. Uh, in the second half of our conversation on this essay when it comes up in a little bit. Um, but I just throw, the, throw that out there because what Bishop does here in terms of the course is he demonstrates another very practical, very beneficial way to approach the conception of zombie, the concept of zombie, and he uh, provides some terms and some concepts that we might then start to use to think about other films that we've watched. So what happens when I take Hegel's master-slave dialectic and I apply it to things like uh, Revolt of the Zombies, King of the Zombies, Sex Maniac, for example. There might be all kinds of interesting things that we could say. What happens when I take something like Spivak's conception of the subaltern and I start to apply it to these other movies? What kinds of interesting things can I say? What kinds of interesting things might you say now that you have some additional tools to work with if you so choose? So again, it's a fun article. I'm going to throw up a little link um, uh, for any of you who are interested where you can see uh, Dr. Bishop giving a TED Talk. It's a great TED Talk. He's a very engaging speaker. He's fun to listen to. Um, and so if you're interested in that, I will, uh, I will throw that your way. But otherwise, uh, I really hope you enjoy the essay.